Hello Matu Jamin, you're watching Hornbill TV. Today we have a very special guest with us. We have none other than the Chief Secretary of Nagaland, Sir J. Alam with us today. And Sir, we understand that you are one of the busiest person in Nagaland. You're always working here. But thank you so much for uh, giving us, um, uh, we are honored to have you here and we thank you so much for giving us this time, Sir. No, it's a pleasure talking to you. So before we move on with the conversation here, I have said a lot of questions for you, as, as you know. And uh, but uh, we always see you in the papers about policy making and everything. But we don't know much about uh, your personal life. So mm -hmm. if you would be comfortable enough, would you like to share uh, some some of it, sir? Yeah, yeah, sure. No, as uh, you may be knowing, uh, I am an officer of the 1991 right. batch of Nagaland Kader, and. Uh, Ever since then, actually, I am here in Nagaland, except for uh, a few years when I was on deputation to Government of India. In the state of Nagaland, I have worked in the uh, districts of Peik, Mon, right. and Twinsa during my district days. And I also worked as Secretary of Industry and Commerce for about four years. Then after that, I had been to Delhi, I worked in some ministries like fertilizers, steel, like that. And um, I have worked as Home Commissioner, CEO of elections, and then uh, several other departments mm -hmm. before becoming Chief Secretary. In the Government of India also I have worked in the Ministry of HRD, which is now Ministry of Education. and. Uh, I have also worked in the Ministry of Minority Affairs. So like that, nice. yeah, uh, we have seen Nagaland for the past 30 years and a uh, lot of changes are there. Yes. So I mean the list will just go on and on, you know, but we would also want to know, uh, besides all this work you, you do every time, uh, how do you time uh, find time for yourself and also for your family? Yeah, it's a bit uh, difficult to have that, uh, what do you call, work-life balance. Right. But uh, yes, my actually I have grown up children, they are working in Delhi. My wife is here with me in uh, Nagaland. So we are together, that's a good thing. At least uh, in the evenings we are together like that. So it's quite pleasant, yeah. So now that you're here for a very long time, uh, how do you find Nagalin? Have you been able to uh, blend in here? What would you say? Uh, I should say I am quite uh, well integrated okay. with Nagaland. I have no problem working here. And having worked in some of the very remote places, uh, I know the conditions also. And uh, I have no, no issues working. Uh, I feel that uh, um, people are comfortable with me. And uh, I also try my best to, you know, uh, have an empathetic attitude so that we understand the other's point of view and try to take, uh, you know, be just and fair. That is uh, my mantra. So, uh, since you have worked not only here in Nagaland but also other states, uh, comparing to Nagaland, uh, comparing Nagaland with other states, mm -hmm. what is the difference that you see in administration and also policy making? Of course, uh, there are many differences. Uh, you see, Nagaland is a small place, so our systems are also simple, which is actually a good thing in many ways. But as we are growing, you know, from simplicity to complexity, we perhaps need better systems and more formal systems. Uh, as we know, because of our uh, traditional, you know, living, we do not have land tenure systems in Nagaland as such. It's all oral tradition. Uh, even land records are not there. So, in one sense, one might say that a big difference is that there is no revenue administration, which actually is a major part of administration in other states. And secondly, since our systems are more informal and uh, they are actually simpler, 
so that way there is less litigation also okay. in nagaland so that also adds to less complexity apart from that nagaland has some very unique advantages you know we have a very strong village council system we have uh, vdbs we have communitization so this social capital in nagaland is very strong and that comes in handy in dealing with many of the administrative problems in fact our villages you would see are better than the towns okay. everybody says that whoever comes to nagaland so that way i think uh, there are some pluses and some minuses okay. but uh, more on the positive side i should say so would you say that uh, nagaland has been left with a state of uh, administrative stagnation due to the lack of government check and balance um i wouldn't um, say that there are no checks and balances in fact uh, it is the other way around all the oversight mechanisms which are there in other places they are there in nagaland also particularly you see we have the institution of lokayukta we have the information commission we have the cag and we have uh, many other uh, institutions these are actually the kind of checks and balances which help the government to function properly so i don't think there is a stagnation as such maybe the aspiration of the some sections of the people uh, are not uh, to that extent uh, uh, not reaching to their level but otherwise i would say that uh, we have sufficient checks and balances in fact so we can hear for a while uh, what would you say what are the some of the policy areas that nagaland continues to face so nagaland actually is facing a number of issues apart from you know the recent history that we have had for the past say 50 60 years uh, there are some major policy issues that we need to resolve the most important i would say is that we need to have a policy for exploiting our mines and minerals we need a policy on that we need a policy on you know generating our own revenue there are huge potentials in terms of tourism in terms of agriculture based activities in terms of uh, various other industries so these potentials have to be unleashed and that can be done by way of good policies the people also have to come on board on certain things because for any state land is the most important asset right. and unless uh, we deal with our land issues further development becomes it becomes a hurdle so most of these issues are actually related with land once these issues are resolved i am sure nagaland can become a very vibrant and self sufficient state there is no dearth of resources there is no problem with the human resources it's only a question of resolving as a collective uh, you know uh, uh, as a collective uh, decision our uh, mineral resources need to be exploited for the benefit of the people that is very important because minerals lose their importance over the years as new technologies come they will lose importance so at some point of time one would realize that we have the, we had the resource but we did not exploit and it has become worthless yeah. so we should not land up in that kind of situation also well, so we could say that currently the uh, there are three civic issues that the nagaland administration has failed uh, effectively to, to address effectively there would be extortion price rise and also deteriorating urban infrastructure so what are the reasons for this failure if you think it is a failure 
you know, in the first place, I would not consider it as a failure, particularly on the extortion issue. You see, it is a law and order problem, right. and uh, the government has been trying to tackle it in the best way it can. Uh, extortion actually has many facets, I should say. Um, it is connected with, you know, the overall political negotiations, the ceasefire agreement. So, there are certain gaps there which need to be first resolved, that is number one. Number two, the people also, you know, somehow that trust between the law enforcing agencies and the people has to improve so that people become more comfortable in reporting such cases. I believe uh, these days whenever uh, such kind of issues come to the notice of the police, police is taking so much to action in most cases. And we have been booking culprits under NSA and other laws. So, government is taking action, but many times maybe some cases go unreported. So, that is where there is a big challenge. I think uh, that needs to be uh, bridged, I should say, with more confidence among the people, perhaps this can be done. As far as the price rise is, is concerned, you see, Nagaland, as it is since it is in a an easternmost corner of the country, there is always a difference in prices of the mainland and, the, and in Nagaland. But then, uh, wherever these kind of issues are pointed out by the chambers, we take action. There was an issue about this multiplicity of check gates. So, the government decided to remove all those check gates. That has helped in bringing down the prices, particularly the transportation cost. So, like that. If there are any specific things where, you know, a particular commodity is showing price rise, then government takes action. And as far as the other issue is concerned, uh, regarding urban infrastructure. urban infrastructure, so this issue is actually related with the availability of resources that uh, the state has you would know that uh, Nagaland actually has, does not have enough resources of its own. Our tax, own tax and non-tax revenue is less than 10 percent of our total budget. Our total budget is 23,000 crore, out of which uh, our state plan, which is actually funded from the state's re resources is only 820 crore. So, we do not have enough resources. These resources will increase if we have, you know, if we can work on our mines and minerals, we can work on our tourism area, we can work on our, you know, total prohibition uh, is also in one sense, uh, it has its own pros and cons. but. Uh, Many other states are earning huge revenues out of this and generating employment also. So, we need to work on improving our own resource base and once we have those resources, we can spend them more on this kind of thing. Also, so the supposed uh, lack of funds uh, is, is the most cited pretext the government uh, uses to explain away some yes. of the failures. So, uh, has the state engaged in genuine financial uh, management brainstorming and created any policy level solution uh, in this regard? So, our revenues are definitely improving. Um, over the years, in fact, government has taken many austerity measures, trying to reduce the government expenditure also. You would remember uh, some time back during the COVID period, in fact, uh, the government had reduced the non-essential expenditure, put a ban on purchase of vehicles, etc. Those things are still continuing. Uh, employment also in the government has actually reached a saturation level and uh, to that extent, uh, we are not uh, creating too many additional posts. 
So while on the one hand one might say that you are not creating employment, but uh, government is already, I would say it is already over employed, over over staffed. So that expenditure needs to come down, on which uh, government is working. And uh, so far we are a salary based economy and government is actually able to provide these salaries on time to the to the employees which i would say is a is not a small achievement considering that uh, we are totally dependent on central government funding for these things also sir, since we know that we don't have an opposition here do you think that the administrative system uh, needs to be revamped in a way that people can directly approach the government for redress Yes, uh, but um, I think the government uh, is open and uh, there are mechanisms available for the people to reach the government directly. Um, we have, you see, this uh, online systems of filing complaints, we have an RTI system and being a small state, the government is very accessible to the people. If I compare it to any other state in the uh, mainland India, I find that uh, government is more accessible in uh, Nagaland than any other place. So to that extent, I don't think lack of opposition is a hurdle in providing, you know, avenues for people to come up with their grievances. And uh, these grievances are also uh, addressed through these all these mechanisms. Uh, I don't think there is a, any dissatisfaction on that count right. in Nagaland. So is it true that the government leaders interfere too much in the administrative mechanism in Nagaland that citizens' issues have become less of a priority? Uh, I wouldn't call it uh, interference. Uh, you see, as public representatives, the voice of the people has to be uh, given. So that is the job of the political leaders. And that provides actually that puts a check on the uh, bureaucracy also. So that way I think that is a positive function. And uh, with that kind of in input, in fact, the decision making becomes better. Right. If supposing I can envisage a situation where we don't have that kind of uh, public uh, voice. So then it will become like a dictatorship only. Uh, so, so when can uh, Nagaland administration, when can we expect the Nagaland administration to present uh, to the public a concrete and a workable and convincing policy to check illegal immigrants and also stop the number of, uh, number uh, stop it from increasing, sir? Well, that is a very complex issue and uh, we do have a problem in the whole country as a whole the problem of illegal immigration is there and Nagaland is no exception there are laws to deal with it and particularly in Nagaland we have a very strong system of ILP and government is trying its best to enforce it in its true perspective so that way any outsider who comes to Nagaland he has to have the ILP. So ILP becomes the first check. Right. And after that, of course, there is the Foreigners Act under which action can be taken. So that action uh, is going on and um, checking also time to time is going on. But this is a larger issue which perhaps has to be handled uh, in a coordinated manner with the central government. So lastly, uh, what are some of the things that the Nagaland citizens can do to ensure that the government performs in a way that actually develops and uh, grows the, the quality of life of the citizens of Nagaland, sir? Uh, no, that's a very interesting question. Um, people definitely can contribute a lot. Right. Through the civil society organizations, we do get a lot of uh, help and support. We have a very strong system of civil society organizations in Nagaland, be it the students or tribal bodies or uh, different interest groups. They are all uh, 
they help the government in fact in better decision making similarly i think a more aware citizenry in fact is uh, definitely helpful so i would feel that um, maybe the people need to engage more with the government and government also needs to engage with the people more and with that kind of partnership many of the problems can be sorted out uh we have discussed about you know urban problems and then problems relating to law and order etc i think better confidence building between the people and the government will help so if you may want to answer this question uh, people always say when it comes to civil society organizations as mm -hmm. well it's a very controversial thing that uh, so uh, would you want to answer where do the civil society organizations and all these others also draw their line hmm no civil society organizations you see particularly the tribal right. bodies now tribal bodies are actually recognized by the government through the act of the assembly so in the village council and tribal councils act the civil society uh, the tribal um, organizations have been given a specific role apart from that historically you see in nagaland the student bodies the church organization the tribal bodies they have always been playing a very strong role so i don't think that uh, there is an issue of crossing the line anywhere in fact in most of the matters the grievances are voiced by these bodies and then uh, the government tries to be responsive to them and some course correction takes place so in the last few years we have not come across any major confrontation on any of these issues which would i think indicate that uh, the dialogue is there and uh, through that mutual dialogue course correction also takes place right i think that's about all sir thank you so sir. much sir for spending your time and answering all the questions that we had and thank you for your words of wisdom i'm pretty uh, sure that our viewers will also get a very good insight on the policy making and also other stuff sir so thank you so much once again sir thank you so much it was a pleasure talking to you and all the best thank you thank you